All right. Thanks everyone for coming out for today's deep dive session on immersive training, learning, and inspection as part of XR Access Symposium 2022. My name is Tim Stutz. I'm at Cognition and my Twitter handle is at Tim Stutz. That's at T-I-M-S-T-U-T-T-S. -T -T and I'm speaking with Mark Steelman of Transfer. Mark's handle is at S-T-E-E-L-M-A-N-X-R. All right, without further ado, we'll get into our deep dive. In terms of deep dive structure, we're going to start with introductions. These will be pretty brief of Mark and I and our backgrounds. Next, we'll go to Tim on accessible UI UX design. That will take around 20 minutes. And then we'll shift over to Mark on development architecture, enabling accessibility for around 10 minutes. We'll have a Q&A session for 10 minutes, and that will lead to a discussion of questions for the remaining time before we wrap up. All right, so about the moderators. To start, Mark Steelman, he, him. Mark is a longtime XR enthusiast and developer that has a passion for using technology to enable better and more accessible education for everyone. He has worked on projects in the enterprise and entertainment sectors on a variety of XR platforms, including Quest, Magic Leap, HoloLens, Snapchat, and PC VR. He specializes in interaction frameworks and bridging the best practices in XR user experience design with best practices in technical system development. He is a senior Unity engineer at Transfer, working on the future of job training, and has been an XR Access member since summer of 2019, which is actually around the time when I met Mark. I had the unique uh, pleasure of meeting Mark at the first XR Access Symposium at Cornell Tech in person. So sure it's great to be speaking together again. Yep. All right. And about me, Tim Stutz, he, him. So Tim Stutz is a multifaceted designer and design leader drawn to challenges involving spatial computing, interaction, input, user experience, sensory feedback, and systems design. Tim is an ethical technologist who values data privacy and accessibility. He has experience as an individual contributor as well as directing the efforts of design teams to solve complex challenges. Tim is Design Director, Interactive, Interactive Experiences at Cognition and Augmented Reality Neurotech Startup where he's focused around making communications more accessible. He has previously worked at Euphoria, Faceware Technologies, and Magic Leap. I can go a little bit into my journey into XR accessibility design. So XR accessibility, advocacy, and design work. Accessibility for mixed reality was a big part of my day-to-day -day at Magic Leap, where I focused on input, operating system and served as vice chair of the Leapable Group, co-chaired uh, with Bill Curtis Davison. Uh, we, Bill and I, attended the first XR Access Symposium in 2019. So there's a great picture of Bill and I here uh, wearing our Magic Leap One headsets standing in front of the Tata Innovation Center of Cornell Tech. Um, and then some of the other pictures um, at the top, there's a picture of um, Roland Dubois, Bill and I in front of the same center, and some other some other folks along the way that we've met through our community uh, advocacy. Uh, I've worked with XR Access and I've worked with Al Ali VR, and I've spoken twice at Ali VR meetups in the past couple of years. And um, this is my first proper XR uh, talk with Mark, so I'm really excited about that. The image in the bottom right shows a recent talk I gave with Ashley Coffey on accessible multimodal inputs. So my role and team at Euphoria. Um, so I am, was principal augmented reality product designer for Euphoria at PTC May 2021 through May 2022. The pictures on this slide um, you see a woman using our Capture Augmented Reality application in a lab setting. And on the right, a gentleman using our Vantage application, also in an AR setting. Both users are wearing 
uh, Magic Leap or HoloLens headsets um, interacting with mixed reality content. I'll go into more detail with that. The team that I led at Vuforia uh, was the HMD Work Instructions Design Crew. I can go through some of the members real quick in their background. So Joel de Guzman, uh, top left, uh, is a 2D interaction designer. Uh, Steve Jackson works on our mobile products, uh, mobile tablet as well, and is a 2D designer as well. Uh, Luisa Vasquez um, is no longer with Euphoria, but was critical as an advisor to our operation. Dan Lane, uh, bottom left, uh, 3D designer, um, Unity prototyper, um, currently no longer with Euphoria either. Brandy Kennard, bottom left, uh, was a designer who helped us out on these efforts too, also no longer at Euphoria, and then myself, Tim Stutz. Um, leading the group here and involved in all different activities, and I've moved on to cognition. Um, and finally, Suresh Sharma, bottom right uh, engineering prototyper, who was really pivotal on helping us des with design around more technical issues. Let's talk about the head-mounted display use cases and solutions. So, um, Euphoria apps currently run on a number of different head-mounted display platforms. In the top left, there is a Microsoft HoloLens. Um, I, here you see a female user wearing uh, the device. Bottom left, um, another user wearing the Magic Leap device. These are in a similar class. They are both augmented, augmented reality heads-up displays. They um, can track to the environment. You can have what I call what some call that magic leap is pixel stick or persistence of objects within um, environments, which is a unique differentiator with some other AR solutions that are, are less location aware. Um, at the bottom right is uh, a real wear device. So this is another device we support um, with our apps. And it's a tiny little screen. Sometimes we refer to this instead of HMD for head mounted display, we refer to it is head mounted tablet because it is literally a tiny little Android tablet that sits below the eye. And it's great if you're outdoors, it's more rugged. It doesn't do um, true mixed reality, but it provides a small screen and really excellent voice commands. So while I was at Euphoria, on HoloLens 2, we released new capture and vantage applications. We also earlier late last year, deployed Capture and Vantage to Magic Leap. And finally, RealWare, um, we have original Capture and View applications. So we're, we're currently working with, old, they're working with older designs of these apps. So my hypothesis, and on this image, I should say before I get into this, you see a male worker, uh, avionics worker, wearing a HoloLens, and performing a, a hand gesture with equipment in the background. My hypothesis is building usable multimodal input augmented reality applications with multi-sensory feedback in an industrial work setting to overcome barriers benefits accessibility. So furthering on this, the technology has the potential to enable more workers of differing abilities to enter these vocations and perform the jobs. We could talk briefly about the examples of barriers head-mounted displays can help overcome. On the left, here is our original capture application on HoloLens 1. It was entirely uh, targetable via head pose interactions, and you could use a confirmation air tap with your finger to select a button. This, we see a UI with like a take photo button selected. We've come a long way since that, but I wanted to kind of just put that out there. The barriers include optimizes for content readability regardless of lighting conditions, allows for on-screen text, stronger haptic and visual feedback, which helps in loud settings, uses hand gestures to avoid the need to pick up a hardware controller when that's not possible, uses far field hand gestures to eliminate the need to reach for virtual objects that are not reachable, 
and contains calming, simplified design that prevents cognitive overload from overwhelming stimuli. So before I get into the specific apps, I think this diagram will be helpful. Uh, in one slide, I can explain how the Euphoria Work Instructions Pipeline works in terms of applications. So the top row is Capture. This is a step where users in the factory or some similar industrial setting are capturing content. And content could be spatial um, in the form of area target data, which we'll get into. It could be a photo. It could be a uh, video and audio with video, of course. And the user is able to do this hands-free with a head-mounted display, which is great because if you're wearing a HoloLens or Magic Leap, you have both hands-free to hold an object up, which you are describing and potentially manipulating as a part of instructional content. So in addition to having the ability to recognize spaces and store like a point marker, uh, or I should say an area target marker, uh, you'd have you'd have the what we call like a hands-free uh, modality of capture. Um, and then the authoring step is an app called Editor. Editor is a web application. Um, and the reason it doesn't exist on an HMD is because it's fairly complex. This is where a user takes the instructional content, and this is the instructional designer for a factory setting, by the way, would take the instructional content and edit it together into a cohesive uh, experience. So at this point, they're determining um, the steps. Um, they're adding things like uh, um, new images and videos maybe that weren't captured on HMD. They could be brought in from a variety of sources, could be CAD diagrams, etc. And then finally, from editor, they're going to publish into the execute step. For the execute step, we're back on something to note. We're back on HMD. We had capture on HMD and uh, now with execution, we're HMD as well. The application is called Vantage. And Vantage is basically probably the app that has the most traction of the whole pipeline. This application is where the frontline worker is going through and consuming the instructional content built within the other two steps. This app, in addition to running on HoloLens and Magic Leap, also runs um, on mobile tablet for Android and iOS. It even runs on paper. And um, a version of it called View uh, runs on um, the RealWare device. So it's very, very cross-platform. Um, Vuforia has done a great job in that respect. And then finally, and the analysis step. So everything is analyzed in an app called Vuforia Insights, which allows us, um, or rather the uh, supervisor to track progress, to kind of see where users are getting hung up in the process. And that, again, is back on the web. So order H&D, web, H&D again, and then web. So it's a it's kind of a, a mix of, of devices. I'm going to show you an, a, a brief video here and provide more explanation later. But right now, a worker's in the factory, and they're using our Capture app to take a photo and, and earlier, they actually put down a, a marker. That's what you're seeing with the yellow, or sorry, orange circle. Um, and now they're recording a video of themselves lifting a lid. They're going to take another photo of that lid. They touched an on-screen button um, via hand gesture. And then finally, moving away from capture, they're playing back some of this content in Vantage. So we have a split-screen view here where you see... Vantage running on HoloLens 2 on the left and on mobile device on the right. So the same experience. So the user is going through the step content. They're reading a step card with media. There are spatial markers that are guiding the user to different parts of the experience. So we're on step two in the procedure in this case. Um, so it's cross-platform, which is great if you don't have an HMD. So we'll talk about head-mounted display input and sensory feedback opportunities. So to start, the inputs um, for work instructions head-mounted display apps. On the left, near-field hand gesture. So this includes things like tap, but also scrolling. If you imagine like kind of dipping your finger into UI that's at hand's length and moving it up and down, we have that capability too. 
Um, and what you're looking at is a prototype version. Like you see the whole hand rig and it's there by design, not in the final product, but here to show you how we end up tracking the hand. So, the, so that teal spear represents the systems via, via cameras on the device. It's understanding of where the finger exists. It, by knowing where the finger exists, we can understand where the user is pressing. The, in this case, they're dipping their finger into a button um, with AR, XR stuff in general. If it's 3D like this, the notion of hover is a little different than the web. Hover, it, like there's a depth element. So with these MRTK, Mixed Reality Toolkit Framework buttons that our apps are built of, uh, the user, as they approach, those buttons glow. And then eventually there's a collider box that extrudes from the button and you would press in. And it's a really brilliant um, design that Microsoft put together that we that we leverage here. For far field hand gestures like um, air tap. So in the same way you could do a direct tap, you could do an air tap. So to do that, you're going to face the palm of your hand. Tar it's like a palm, palm cast, you might say, at a piece of UI that's at a distance and then do a tap. So you're bringing your thumb and your index together because at that point you're too far away to touch it directly. Functions the same as a click. For Magic Leap only, on the top right, you can do controller interaction. So all of these menus will work with control. Control has the benefit of being very precise and to bonus is that the control doesn't need to be within sight of the camera at all. It can be, you can have it off to the side. We can use six degrees of freedom capability from the control. It knows where it is in space. You could be turn, you could be firing it backwards, holding it up at your belt. Um, it's it's hugely beneficial. The downside is that, of course, you have to use a hand to do it. And that would be using one hand. Um, and uh, you would have less hands in, 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 in the process. Um, the voice commands is another way of interacting with the, um, with the applications. And there's a differentiator with HoloLens and Magic Leap. So HoloLens doesn't have a control, which is unfortunate for six off. Magic Leap does. But on the HoloLens side, the apps at, for voice control, there's no invocation phase. So you can lip phrase, so you can literally say, take a photo. Um, whereas if you're Magic Leap, we have to say, hey, Lumen, as the invocation phrase, and then pause and then give the command. And so on that note, um, you're seeing in the top, in the images on the left with the, with the hand target, you're seeing voice tool tips instructing the users like what they would say. So in this case, they're hovering after a couple seconds that that command would come up reminding them that, hey, you can say this. Um, the same thing happens in HoloLens. We did some hand tracking tests in the beginning that were really important to evaluating viability of hands in an industrial work setting. So we wanted to see what would happen um, like if we put on something like a black glove because workers in the factory sometimes wear dark gloves. And what we learned is that with the dark glove, you'll notice there's no hand tracking. We're missing, we're missing the skeletal input from the hand. So I've outlined that as red, it indicating the hand was not tracked at all, thus not supported. And then there's a hand button itself, which is fully supported because we can we can track and the use the hand. And in addition, users able to activate, i.e., press um, with their hand. And but then there are situations like tape. Uh, tape. I've given a yellow border here to indicate that the hand was tracked, but the activation was very difficult or not possible, implying that um, dwell can work for activation. So on the topic of Dwell, in the original Vuforia capture applications, and as well as Vue, uh, there was this notion of Dwell to select. So you could, just by lingering on UI, there would be a timing indicator. And after, say, a second and a half, that button would click. Uh, it's something we wanted to do again in the uh, initial apps. But then once we added control and the use of hand gesture, Dwell kind of went out the window. It seemed like we had enough other inputs there that we didn't need to actually do it. So the Dwell concern was alleviated over time. It's something that might still come back as an interaction at some point, though. Especially good for hands-free. Let's talk about uh, spatial content placement. Um, so 
Um, on the right, we see a diagram of a uh, profile of a female worker um, who is looking at uh, a, a dialogue uh, from the side that's in front of her by around uh, half a meter. And we're also illustrating the uh, vertical field of view. So for Magic Leap and HoloLens, roughly 30 degrees um, is what we have to work with. So that's like the display area that that we have with, with that device vertically. Um, and so that's illustrating that. But Vivorius HMD apps feature UI elements in field of view that are pinned to world or um, they're tagging along with the user's head pose. Uh, so the one or the other, they're either kind of stuck in the world or they're moving along with the users. The UI regions are that are intended to be targeted with direct interactions, like this dialogue pictured, are placed in, within arm's reach to facilitate hand gestures. Here's a video of, or, or actually, sorry, an image of our input recommendation dialogue. So this is kind of nice. If you're getting into the app, and you're and you're not sure how to interact with it. One of the first things that confronts you on either platform or app uh, for, is uh, a dialogue of input recommendations. So it says Vantage supports hand gestures and voice commands. You can use whatever works best for you. To learn more, go to Vantage uh, um, Arrow support. And then we have diagrams, um, illustrated diagrams done by Joel that beautifully illustrate the far field gesture of tap. Um, or sorry, near field and far field gesture of air tap and then voice commands, in this case, confirm. And uh, this dialogue shows up one time, but it's also something we, this content we use, something we reuse in online support. HMD sensory feedback. So visual, haptic, and sound are kind of the main ones here. I drew these as a Venn diagram. That visual one is the headset display. Uh, um, and also hardware LEDs, in the case of Magic Leap, can sometimes be leveraged. There's actually LEDs around the, um, around the touchpad for the Magic Leap control. And then the haptic can be motor or tactile. There's a haptic motor in Magic Leap's control, which is really helpful, especially for things like hovering UI. Hugely, hugely helpful for that. So every time we hover a button, a small hover haptic is fired off in the device. Incidentally, it's one that I worked on when I was working at Magic Leap. So I was happy to leverage that hover haptic again, which is all over the OS. Um, and then the sound is built-in speakers or headphones. And um, what basically you have the option of pairing um, headphones to the device or using the built-in. And so we worked on uh, around 20 different sounds for these applications. I was actually the sound designer on that project. And we we went through an iterative, iterative process with design to establish brand for Euphoria sonically, and then also just make sure the sounds worked in context for the different UI functions. Um, I'm gonna go really briefly into capture and vantage apps for HoloLens and Magic Leap. The main point of the talk, the bulk of it, was the broader input and sensor feedback section cover, but I can just kind of go through this fast. So this is capture for HoloLens um, and Magic Leap. And so in this picture, we see a lab worker with a capture menu vertically oriented uh, off to the left of their field of view. And they're, they're working on a, like a, 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 worth a flask and they're taking, presumably they use a voice command to take a photo because their hands are occupied holding the flask and there's a snapshot of the photo that shows up on the screen before them. Um, in, in this app, um, Capture, um, one of the things you can navigate to off the, off the main menu of items is, is a settings area. And there's not a lot in terms of accessibility in the early version of this app, but um, there is a toggle that to set um, left or right orientation of capture menu. Um, and I'm going to get into that research soon. Um, there's a whole slide for that, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, here is the capture menu. Uh, there's a shot of it. It's, it's vertical. I'll stop saying vertical from now on because it's actually always vertical. Funny quick fact, used to be horizontal in the original capture app. We shifted it to be vertical uh, for screen real estate reasons, actually. Um, and the, by 
by increasing the, the, the vertical height of the workstation space, uh, we believe that this is this is a better layout for users. It's not going to clutter the, their lower half. It also allows for voice tips to render um, to the immediate right or left of the buttons. Let's talk about the different buttons. So the top one is a thumbtack. Um, that's pin and unpin. Um, the bottom is, uh, or, or the, the one below that, the thumb is a, a pause button that's currently recording. So the pause icon indicates the intent if you were to select it, but there's red uh, um, trailers around it that indicate that it's recording. And the, this app is actually always recording, which is really interesting. There's no way to pause it at this point. So something we have to communicate to the user, and we do so through a number of ways. There's a notification that comes up that tells them so. There's also this constant rolling tape recording thing, something we will change in the future for sure, or, or they will change. Uh, photo icon underneath that, snap a photo, uh, uh, marker icon below it. I'm just going to go to the next slide because I remembered uh, that this slide describes all of that perfectly. So the same content I just shared. Uh, picking up with the photo, the second to bottom button is a place location button. And then there's a next step button to advance to a next step in capture and a step indicator. You can only go forward with capture for now. All right, and now you see a video of it in operation. There's um, Yogi who filmed this video taking a snapshot. You have an image preview of what you just took. And now he's just showing basically you can cancel, like there's a floating X button to cancel photo functions if you're not happy with the photo before you even took it. Let's go on to the next one, location placement. So this is an interaction that's um, that's one that's probably the most spatial of them all. So from here, when you initiate placement um, and you would say, hey, Lumen, place anchor to get to this point where in step two, you see um, a user with a head cast from their device with a, in a orange reticle or circle on the end at the target. And they would basically look around the world, scan the world, and, and that orange circle would show up on the mesh. And then they could say save anchor, or they could do air tap to, to save it, or if you have a magic loop controller trigger. And so then when it's, once it's placed, it actually, um, that marker represented as like a drop or like a, a broken um, circular reticle. Um, is responsive depending on whether you're near or far to it. I'll get into that more in, in another slide. There's a better slide. But this one slow shows um, shows the, the interactions I just described. So yeah, you see the circle moving along the surface. It, they're moving it with their head. And at some point, the user will say, um, he canceled it at this point, but he'd be able to, he'd be able to save it with voice or... Uh, or gesture. Come on, place it. <laughs> there we go. So he does the finger tap to place it. What's interesting is the hand cast in this case has nothing to do with the placement of the marker. This is something that needs to be worked out because it's confusing. I'll talk just briefly about text entry. So there as, were a couple points where we needed to perform text entry. In this case, uh, it wasn't possible to do it in uh, Magic Leap because the system keyboard uh, does not render within Unity apps. Um, and we needed a keyboard that could work with hand gesture. HoloLens provided that keyboard. It was very tricky to work with, but we managed to kind of put something together. So here that you're going to click an edit button on a dialogue. You're editing the session title. So there's a system keyboard that shows up below and the user is typing with their fingers. It's floating in front of them. And then you see a little menu on the top and that has a text field with the, with the string. So they're able to rename uh, a session via that interaction. Uh, it's very, text entry is, is, is in its very early stage with, within augmented reality right now. It's um, something that, that needs to be improved overall in our industry for sure. Um, auto scaling menu based on user distance. So we have scalable menus that if they're if they're pinned in the world, if you move away past a certain threshold, uh, they will expand um, and be legible up to um, up to around three meters away, which is great, and it improves targetability for for the the hand cast interaction. 
There you can see the pin and unpin, and you can watch it grow and expand based on how far away the user is from, from the menu. There's a sound a cup that coupled with that too. Um, so I'll talk about the capture menu alignment research for um, left and right. We learned that um, people are actually divided. And I think this is one of the more interesting findings is people are very divided in terms of whether it should be left or right. Our sample size was only uh, 14. Um, and what's interesting is we found, even though there was only one left-handed person in the sample, um, we we did find that it was pretty divided in terms of left or right preference. And what it, what it really comes down to is the user might be left-handed, but they might want to use that left hand, which is their dominant hand, to hold an object. So therefore, they would use their right hand to operate a menu or hold a control. So it's really interesting. It was it was it was quite a close split. We ended up um, settling for left as the initial default, but um, that was a valuable learning lesson. I don't have too much time. I'm going to um, just kind of breeze through Vantage. So this is the other app that does the public publishing. So here you see a worker playing back content in an industrial setting. There's a step card floating in the air in front of them with media on the right related to that step. And then there's a, a marker with a wayfinding ribbon connecting the marker to the, to the uh, step card content. And the user's reaching out to play back a video to press a button uh, for play. Here's the van. Here's a one of the menus, the main menus for the system. Vantage is interesting because like uh, the the main function is launching a procedure, but it's a QR code scan. So to launch it, because typing is so tricky with this device, we didn't want to type if we didn't have to. So the way we launch procedures initially is just through QR code scanning. So you need to print the QR code scanning from our editor app or pull it up in uh, the Vantage mobile app via, um, or any Vantage app with a function called send to eyewear. And then you'll get the QR code for that procedure. So you'll scan it by, by placing the code within those brackets on the left. So you see these square brackets and uh, voila on the right, it's recognized or it failed to recognize. There's a nice sound that I designed conjunct in conjunction with failure or acceptance. If it's an acceptant, accepted uh, QR code, You'll go to a procedure overview screen. I skipped that um, one. It's just an overview of what's going on uh, with this particular procedure. And after that, you'll wind up at a list. So this list shows you uh, the different steps. So um, in this case, there are 15. They're in a table. The table is vertically scrollable. And um, yeah, basically you they're numbered and there's text and there's buttons to, to kind of move in at any step. In most cases you'd start at step one, but sometimes you might want to jump to step two if you finish step one and like one or something. And you also have the function to delete the session or or finish the session. Um, here's a step card and it's pinned to the world. So that's why it's further back. It seems smaller. The perspective is tricky because this was done in put together in Figma. But at this 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 one at this view it is a couple meters back. So a user can perform these indirect Interaction, so you see like a hand cast um, going to a button and the user performing an air tap gesture. Uh, the media panel is pretty straightforward. There's, uh, you can see that what number media of what. Uh, you can see how much time you are. There's a progress indicator and this user has ability to jog back and forth in time for video or close the video via close button. Um, Vantage location-based step navigation. So the, the location, the locations that have steps, um, we're dealing with a location marker. We're also dealing with the step card, and the the juxtaposition of those two is a really tricky problem. So if a user moves away from a step, which is basically like an area, a step marker, which is basically like an area target, like a determined part of the mesh where the step should take place, we need to be able to guide them back. So that's where the um, the wayfinding ribbon comes into place. It's a series of orange dots trailing back. Um, and um, sometimes we move the step card with them if it's if it's locked to the head pose or unpinned state. And other times 
it's it's just left in the world where they like where they would like to keep it for that particular step, which we will cache by the way. So there are situations where they might turn away and see nothing. And so we have UI to remind them to come back. And we also have this wayfinding ribbon as well. Here's a quick video of a user moving towards a wayfinding ribbon. And then you see a fade out when you get close enough. And then finally you see that marker morph into a reticle, which goes completely away when the head gets too close, because at that point all the UI is closer than the near field clipping plane and the device can't render anyways. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip this video because the other one from from our 3D designer Van Than showed it beautifully. Um, great. And I will end the Magic Leap work here. Here's another uh, dialogue showing a an overview kind of like the input overview, but this one's for the Vantage menu itself. So this is something, it's a one time that users will see. It has instructions on what all the areas are uh, in the Vantage step card text and imagery. So next steps for Euphoria are to leverage uh, additional inputs, e.g. eye tracking, voice dictation, and outputs. So one of them could be text to speech. Um, something that could re be really great is if notifications coming in could be sonified. Um, and there might even, there's already a sound effect for their reveal, but if we provide uh, speech versions of the notification, there might even be a case to take the visual version completely away. Users might be able to select and say, all I want is um, visual stuff um, or just sound stuff or both. Um, introducing manual and automatic validation for step completion on HMD applications. So with automatic, this is a really exciting step where computer vision could help validate the completion of a procedure. So imagine a world where your step two says tighten the screw. Well, currently you just have to move to the next step and it's kind of understood that you've done it. Uh, manual would be passing or failing that in saying like yes i did it explicitly with with a like a, a like a toggle interaction and then the the automatic is the frontier where it's like i'm looking at the device and i can see that it's or somehow understand that it's installed correctly and then auto advance the user to the next step which is which is on the horizon and yeah this will give it the h and apps, once we have this stuff, we'll have feature parity with some of our other applications. We'll broaden support uh, for the platforms supported by Capture and Vuforia uh, Vantage apps. More devices generally equals better inclusion. So there might be other devices in the future that support these. And these are my hopes for Vuforia. And for now, though, I have moved onward. And I'm now Design Director of Interactive Experiences at Cognition, an augmented reality and brain-computer interface startup working towards a number of accessibility goals for our users. So here I am pictured wearing our flagship product, Cognition One. And you see uh, it's an HMD, as you can tell. Uh, and what you see out the front is a projection, like a, a user who uh, has ALS or, or some... Uh, um, disability that prevents them from speaking or moving. The the long term goal is the ability to like using a brain computer interface to think about of what you might want to say or do, and out the front of the device you'd have the option to like communicate that to users. But there's also inward projection capabilities with this device as well. Currently, where the user through head pose, if they have control of their head can do things like type and interact with Alexa and so forth. I'm gonna just be really brief on these slides. Uh, here is a great slide of the Cognition One headset. Um, Awaken your senses, immersive augmented experiences and biofeedback. Um, and then this is the part that's the most exciting I find is the interact with your mind. So there's a, a BCI brain computer interface on the back of the device that can pick up brain signals. And we can take those and use sensory fusion, like blend head pose and voice and BCI to do some really interesting things on the input side. Um, our technology will transform the life for the most physically restricted 
enrich life for all and enhance how we all interact with people, places, and things. And so in these pictures, you see someone, um, a, a user wearing Cognition One, um, whose name is Chris, uh, who has disabilities that um, um, affect motor control. And so uh, Chris is able to uh, type text out on our device. And so you see an, a UI in the bottom left of a, of a keyboard um, where a user can perform a number of text interactions and select different strings and then project those out to the front of the device via display or voice. And uh, the idea is also to control um, smart home stuff like this Nest and uh, control robots. Personal mobility is on the horizon. I'm excited to be more involved with the XR Access organization moving forward, and we'll share more details as things develop here. I'm going to shift it over to Mark now. Um, Mark, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. That was a really great uh, exploration into you know the design of the features in you know, the Euphoria apps um, and as well of a, a glimpse of cognition. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just be covering um, kind of a developer's perspective on implementing accessible features and making sure that your application system has kind of the underlying structure that's required to support accessible features. Can you go to the next slide? Great, so the first step in, you know, making sure you're gonna have an application with accessible features. It's just doing a feature assessment of, you know, if you already have an application that you wanna make more accessible, uh, or you just, you know, are starting an application and you want to outline, uh, you know, what those features are, you should probably look at something like a VPAT uh, and really just assess the accessibility of, you know, your current product and where you want to go. Um, and the VPAT is the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, which is provided by the US government uh, through Section 508. Um, but this can be challenging, especially if you're you know, essentially doing a VPAT on an existing product. Um, so as Tim mentioned earlier, I'm a senior Unity engineer at Transfer, and we do job training in VR to help people get jobs. Um, and we have a very, very large library of content, uh, over 200 trainings now in a variety of industries such as construction, uh, safety training, and automotive. Um, but it is very difficult task to essentially go through all of the 200 trainings and all of that content and, and assess, the, uh, assess the accessibility of each of those. So what we had to do when we were doing our, our VPAT is essentially pick a subset of our content that's representative of the different types of experiences that you might have throughout our trainings. Um, we also had to collaborate with others in the organization to just, you know, get, you know, opinions from people who are familiar with a wide variety of content. Not everyone knows every single one of our trainings, right? Um, so definitely always make sure as you're, you know, going through a VPAT just to make sure that multiple people in the company see it and make sure that, you know, nothing is missing. Um, and, you know, when you're determining if, uh, if your product meets, you know, a particular criteria item on a VPAT, you know, sometimes you have to uh, settle for partially supports because these things can be a spectrum. It's not always binary. So for instance, whether or not your application requires multiple hands, right? In our trainings, we have some trainings that require two hands and we have others that don't. Um, and so, you know, for that, we would say we partially support, you know, one-handed interactions. Um, and, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if you can, providing whatever detail uh, as to where on the spectrum your product falls can be helpful. Um, and, you know, even though, the VPAT is not something you see super often in the XR field. Uh, the way the law is set up, you know, it applies to all computer software, right? Section 508. Um, and so that means it applies to VR and AR. Um, and even though it doesn't, you know, necessarily outline explicit kind of VR, AR unique criteria, um, 
you still certainly will want to try to uh, specify, you know, the accessibilities of, of those certain, you know, features. Next slide. So um, just to touch on some of the achievable features that you might want to have uh, in an application, and, and uh, Tim has kind of touched on some of these, is uh, you want to have controller tutorials. Uh, if you have controllers on the device you're targeting, you want to have uh, different means of uh, you know, going about certain interactions or different input methods. So that could be zero hands, one or two. Uh, you want to have captions. Um, an accessibility object model is something that I'll elaborate on later, but this can be extremely helpful for making your applications compatible with screen readers. Pausing and playing, um, and this has kind of implications for coroutines, uh, which is kind of a technical aspect that I'll elaborate on. Uh, skipping and rewinding as well, um, and locomotion, which is kind of how you move throughout a virtual environment. And I think an important thing to note is it's really best to get away from the concept of accessibility features. Um, really, these features are just good features. They make your app more usable by more people. And, you know, that said, it does help to point out when a feature makes a significant contribution to the accessibility of an application. Um, but it's the kind of mindset of these are just things that you want to make a good product. It's not an additional feature that needs to come with a separate accessibility budget. So, um, yeah. Uh, this is not a super comprehensive list, but these are some of the, you know, features that with today's technology are uh, certainly, you know, achievable. Next slide. So uh, there's, it's really important that, you know, once you've identified the features you need, that you make sure that your application system uh, you know, the kind of underlying infrastructure upon which you're building your content uh, is going to make it easy to support these features. And that as you add new content, you're not having to rebuild these features into that content um, because that definitely uh, is not a scalable way of making a product accessible. And that's something that we're looking into very heavily at Transfer is how do we make sure we have scalable design and scalable features. Um, and so this is, you know, a picture of a Unity, you know, uh, game object inspector window. Um, and that's just kind of a technical aspect of de developing XR content within Unity. And, you know, the one really important consideration here is that it's a lot harder to make system level changes to support, you know, certain features after a lot of content has already been built. You really want to think about these things before you start scaling the content on your application system. So next slide. Um, so I'm going to kind of deep uh, get, give a little more detail in, into some of the, uh, you know, achievable features that I mentioned a couple slides ago. So for inputs and interaction methods, you know, I mentioned controller tutorials. You really always want to have tutorials uh, for how to use your inputs, like controllers, hand tracking, gaze input. Today, a lot of people still have yet to try VR or AR. And these controllers feel very foreign, especially in VR when you're essentially putting someone in a new environment and they're just kind of, their mindset is changed when they're in an unfamiliar place. Um, and so you really want to make sure people learn how to use their inputs. Um, and you also, you know, you, you do want to consider things like, you know, once someone has, uh, you know, already learned an input, you don't want to just have annoying pop-ups every time they need to use that input, right? So, you know, if you want to, for instance, track uh, whether a user has already done a tutorial on a particular input, right, that could lead to a better user experience. But if you want to have this, you know, kind of enhanced version of these tutorial features, right? Tracking whether a user has done uh, the tutorial already has kind of local or cloud data storage implications, right? So you have to think about that from an architecture perspective. And, you know, you need to have a common kind of API for your developers building content 
to make sure that they know when to trigger these tutorials um, and in a consistent way, especially if you have a large body of contact. Um, yeah, and you know, a general kind of tidbit is that you just want to, for any user interaction, have as many types of inputs as possible. Um, you know, Tim showed some great examples earlier of how you know you can use voice input versus hand tracking input versus controller input or head pose. Right. This is just going to allow you know a wide variety of users to achieve the tasks that they want to in the application. And um, some of the underlying uh, systems that are really you know leading the way on this front in the XR industry uh, are you know stuff like the Open XR standard which is really uh, making sure that application developers can just, you know, if you build for OpenXR, you don't have to think about building for five different devices separately. You build for the OpenXR spec, and then every device that is compliant with OpenXR, you will have very little work to do to make sure that your application works uh, on these OpenXR compatible devices. Next slide. Oops, is that the next? Hold on. No, nope. captions. There we go. All set. So captions and audio systems, which are very important for, you know, uh, both people with hearing issues, but also for people who, for instance, are doing VR in just a loud environment, right? Um, you, if you want to have captions, all of your audio needs to have, you know, a way of exposing the text form of it. How do you actually do that? Like, what, what is the data structure for doing that? You could have it embedded into the file itself. You could have a, an object like a wrapper that kind of contains the audio file and other metadata, um, you know, including the text for captions, but potentially other things. Um, and you might want to consider like, what if you want to express the loudness of a file? You know, does your system have a way of ingesting it? So I'm not going to get into the actual details of like, how you should implement these things, but these are just like important considerations to think of. Next slide. Objects and display compatibility. So in an XR application, you're probably going to have lots of different digital objects, and you really want to make sure that all of these objects have a way of exposing the important data about them to different display systems. So different users are going to have access to different displays. You know, some low vision users uh, or people that don't have you know access to audio displays. And one way of doing this is by having an accessibility object model for all of the digital objects in your application. And what this is is it's a model for uh, the data um, in about all of your objects, and this can be stuff like the name and description, which is really important to have for stuff like screen reader compatibility. You might have the color, the shape of the object, texture or material properties, weight, and maybe even something like the sound when you drop it, whether or not it shatters or whether it's just a thud. Um, and so by having this data accessible from a kind of you know architectural level, as long as that data is there and presented in a good way, you really should be able to have uh, users be able to access that data in whichever way that uh, is most accessible to them. And you also might even have relative data, such as the proximity of an object to a user. Um, and that can be super important if you're a low vision user and you want to say, hey, what are the objects within arm's reach, right? Having a function at a system level that's able to kind of query all the objects in arm's reach can be very helpful. Next slide, please. Playing and pausing, this is also another uh, really important feature to allow things like taking a break or changing your settings. Um, but if you want to be able to have playing and pausing in your application, you need a common way, uh, a system level way of interrupting and resuming all forms of sequences that might be running. Um, so for an example, if you are in a VR experience and you need to pick up an object, um, it's, you know, the system is waiting for you to pick up the object and every second, seven seconds you don't, you hear a reminder audio and after 20 seconds, the object highlights, you know, these kind of like wait, you know, wait for a certain amount of time to do a thing, you could consider that a sequence or a coroutine. 
Um, and if you hit pause during that sequence, you know, you need to be able to pause that seven second timer, pause the audio, uh, the reminder audio, if it's in the middle of playing and pausing the highlighting timer. And when you have a complex application, you might have lots of different sequences going on simultaneously. And you don't want to manually write all the code to handle, you know, pausing and playing for each sequence, um, especially since, you know, the number and nature of sequences is probably going to change over the course of designing and refining what your experience is. So having things being, you know, by default being interruptible, uh, and always listening to kind of global play and pause events will essentially allow you to get this feature for free. Next slide, please. Skipping and rewinding, uh, you know, this is kind of similar, um, but, uh, you know, it's a very important feature uh, for users that want to be able to repeat content or skip content that they've already experienced. Um, but, Unlike video, XR content doesn't just live on a singular timeline. You know, at any given point in an experience, you'll have different objects in different states. So objects that are visible or not visible, objects in one part of the room uh, get moved to another part of the room in different points in the experience. So, um, for example, if you have a tool, right, that you need to pick up on the table and at a later step in that experience, you know, there's also, you know, the tool isn't there, but a machine is in that spot. And so if you want to be able to skip between those two points of the application, right, you need to make sure that the machine is correctly enabled or the tool is correctly enabled. Uh, and, you know, this is essentially, you can achieve this with what's called a state machine. And I won't get into the technical details, but essentially this is just saying uh, at any given state, in the experience, what are all the states of the different objects? Um, and this is really important because it'll allow you to uh, be more accessible uh, to users to be able to skip and rewind. Uh, but it's also very important for development. Um, you know, if you have bugs in your experience, you don't necessarily want to go through, if you have a bug at minute 30 in the experience, you don't have to go through the entire 30 minutes of the experience just to see if that bug got fixed in the right way, right? You want to just be able to skip right there. And this also, you know, kind of directly relates to progress saving as well. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have uh, locomotion and comfort. So like I said, locomotion is this kind of the way you can navigate virtual spaces. Um, and oftentimes when you have virtual movement, you need to make sure that the user is comfortable. And this is especially true in VR where you can get, uh, you know, VR nausea if you don't do this well. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to do this, uh, so that you can be accessible to people with varying levels of mobility, right? Um, and you have different ways of doing locomotion. You have actual walking around in your real world space. You can teleport, you can use the joystick to kind of slide like a, like a Xbox game. And some of these types of movements can be uncomfortable, as I mentioned, um, and there's tricks like field of view reduction um, or, or static reference frames that can help do this. But you, those are the kind of, you know, these locomotion systems are something you need to think about carefully and you definitely don't want to add them at the end, right? If you try to add, you know, teleporting, you know, to your content ecosystem after the fact, well, it might not work so well because you might not have, you know, the zones where a user is allowed to teleport set up properly. Uh, and that could lead to things like, teleporting through a wall, which is not a great user experience. Next slide. Great, so uh, unfortunately we don't have any more time for a Q&A, um, but we certainly can help answer questions on Slack uh, after the symposium. Um, but we do wanna leave you with some discussion questions to think about, um, you know, as you kind of, yeah, go forth uh, with all this new knowledge from uh, this deep dive. Um, so, you know, for, for training and learning applications, how can we tailor experiences to a user's learning ability? How are XR enhancements of vocational jobs going to improve the hiring process 
enabling more people to, with different levels of abilities to get jobs that they might not have been able to get before uh, having XR technology. Also, how do you think XR training can prolong human involvement in increasingly automated fields? Um, and lastly, we, we really would love to open it up to uh, you know, the community to think of other questions that we should be answering um, because, you know, these are complex topics and uh, we're never going to be able to, you know, provide full answers. But um, as Meryl Evans always says, progress over perfection. Um, and, you know, the more people that we have talking about these questions and asking questions, uh, the better we'll be able to do to make XR more accessible. Yeah, and so just lastly, wrapping up, <clears throat> we've talked about a lot of things in this talk. Uh, Tim went very deep into the design of different augmented reality applications um, and some of the features there um, for kind of uh, using AR in um, kind of industrial job situations. And I also covered some uh, topics, including, you know, assessing uh, a product's uh, accessibility features and future accessibility features, as well as, you know, high level development considerations for some of these, you know, important features. So, yeah, thank you so much for uh, attending our talk. And um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Take care.